Okay, welcome to lecture two of CS159, Data-Driven Algorithm Design. In lecture two, we'll be going over uh, a few topics that are going to be connected to each other. Um, all right, let's get started. So we're going to start with talking about optimization, in particular Bayesian optimization. So here's the outline of this lecture. Um, in part A, which is this part, we'll be doing an introduction to Bayesian optimization, primarily using Gaussian processes and discuss connections to Molitor and bandits. And in part B, we'll talk about the algorithm configuration, which is one of the topics of the course, and talk about versions of algorithm configuration that reduce to, that can, or can be framed as a standard Bayesian optimization or bandit problem, and versions that are less easily framed that way, and other algorithms that can complement Bayesian optimization algorithms. So that's going to be the outline of the lecture today. And so Bayesian optimization is really um, one of the, you know, the, the founding paradigm, uh, the foundational paradigms that, that can be used to think about goal-oriented experiment design. So classically, and we'll talk about connections to algorithmic configuration later on, but classically you can think of it as the follows. We have an experiment designer, uh, classically a, um, a human increasingly an algorithm, and we have an experimental platform that one could run an experiment and measure some sort of uh, response variable. And so the experiment designer designs an experiment on the platform. We run the experiment, we take a measurement, and we feed it back to the experiment designer, who then you know, takes that measurement to then think about what experiment to design next. And so th some things to keep in mind is that this process is iterative and adaptive. It, it happens sequentially, and it happens in a way where the designer is adapting to the measurements that they receive. And most importantly, a more, a, a, this process is utility maximizing, which means that the goal of the designer is to find some best outcome. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that means throughout the, uh, throughout the lecture. There are many applications ranging, uh, you know, this is just a sampling of, of, of many others. Uh, these are some that have happened here at Caltech from designing better uh, controllers, tuning the parameters of controllers, designing materials and biochemicals, and, um, and things of that nature. Um, so this is what Bayesian optimization looks like. So, uh, so it looks like the before. Um, there's a few things that I added, which is in the top right corner, which is now we have a design space, and then we have this fitness function over the design space. So for any, for any design or experiment, so capital X refers to an experiment or that, uh, the space of experiments that we could run. Um, and we have a fitness function that's unknown to us, but we can take measurements of it um, by running experiments and observing the outcomes. So we, we run an experiment, then we, we query f of x. Uh, that's what running an experiment means. And then, and importantly, in Bayesian optimization, we, have, we maintain a Bayesian belief or a Bayesian posterior over what this fitness function might be given the observations that we've collected so far. So capital S is the set of measurements that we've collected so far. And we maintain a Bayesian belief over what this fitness function might be given the observations we made so far. And so uh, in other words, we maintain a Bayesian belief or an uncertainty over the fitness function, what it might be. And we choose experiments um, to help identify the highest fitness action. So the ultimate goal is to choose the experiment, choose the X that has highest F of X. Um, and, and we need to do so while not completely understanding what F is. So here's a more formal problem setting. Um, so we have a, an experiment budget of capital T where each experiment costs the same unit. And at every iteration, little t, we select an experiment. So we select an X. We run the, uh, we run the experiment on our platform and that in this, formal abstraction amounts to measuring a y, which is, which is equal to f of x plus some measurement noise. And we add x comma y to our measurement set and we update our Bayesian model. Or, and um, in, Bayesian op or in Bayesian optimization, sorry, the, the, what, what was described above need not be Bayesian, but in Bayesian optimization or an optimization in general, the goal is to minimize uh, the, um, the goal is to minimize the, um, 
the what's called a simple regret. So f of x star is the true optimal action. So x star is the action that has the highest fitness. And x hat of star is what our Bayesian model thinks of as the optimal action. Um, so we have a belief over what f might be. And given our beliefs, we have an x hat star, which we think is the optimal action under our, under our, under our beliefs, but may not be the actual optimal action. Because our, our, our Bayesian model is an, in, is a, is an approximate uh, uh, gives an approximation of, um, of the uh, true maximizer. Um, was there a question? Yeah, um, the start of this slide, you were muted for most of it, and it seems to be a common experience. Uh, so, the, so the question is about the fact that the, the, the beginning of the slides tend to be review? Uh, no, as in we could not hear your microphone. Okay. Uh, from the can, start can you, of this line. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, so just to repeat this slide, um, uh, the formal problem setting is that just this is the first major bullet point. The formal problem setting is we have a budget of capital T where every experiment costs the same unit of cost. We select an experiment that's equal to selecting an X. We run the experiment, which is equivalent to running the experiment on our platform. And for the purposes of this mathematical formulation, we measure, we take this measurement Y, which is, which is mathematically equal to querying F of X plus noise, which is the measurement noise. And we add X comma Y to our measurement set or our training set, if you will, and we update our model. In Bayesian optimization, uh, the goal is to find, uh, is to ultimately choose an X hat star. X hat star is what we think after all these rounds of experimentation is the maximizer. So we have a model of what F might be. And under our model, X hat star is the maximizer. And the true maximizer is x star. And we, we measure the difference in the utility between f of x star and f of x hat star. So what is the true fitness difference? And this is typically not something that we can measure in, in a real experiment because we don't know what f is. But we can certainly measure this in a simulation where we know what f is because we're simulating it. Or we can sometimes um, uh, uh, analyze this gap theoretically. Uh, a related problem is called multi-arm bandits. And in multi-arm bandits, uh, it's the same setup as the above, but the goal is to minimize what's called the cumulative regret rather than the simple regret. And the, and the basic idea is that we run this process for capital T uh, iterations, and we want to consider the, the total difference in uh, the fitness functions of the actions or experiments that we selected versus if we knew what X star was a priori and we just ran X star for every experiment. So if we ran X star for every experiment, we would receive T times F of X star utility. Whereas the utility we did receive, the accumulated utility we received for every experiment we ran is the sum that you see in the bottom. So that's the key difference. Okay, so here's a uh, yes question. Is there a question? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, about the previous slide, um, should should there be like a, some sort of norm for those uh, regrets? Because it, it seems like there's nothing to get it from just keep going negative with your f of x hat. Okay, so uh, I. Uh, so nothing, every, this is just the definition of regret. What you're talking about okay. is, an, is an actual value of this. And, in the, in the, and to do that, certainly we need to uh, state more things, talk about what F is, talk about the model class. This is just the, this is just the definition of regret. Uh, I think it's like, if, you, if, you're, if you're trying to minimize F of X star minus F of X hat, can't that just go negative? Right. F, F of Let's X star going. is the maximizer of F. Uh, uh, sorry, F of X star minus F of X hat, right? 
or and uh, why can't that go negative basically if you're changing x hat why can't you choose x hat to just keep going negative like if, even if it's like a linear f so again that depends on that de that question already presupposes um that that question is not part of the definition of regret okay yeah so the de this is literally the definition of regret and your question is your, your question is about compact whether or not x x lives in a compact set or not that is orthogonal to the actual definition of regret. Right, so in practice, capital X, just to follow up on that question a little bit, in practice, capital X typically lives in a compact set, which means it's uh, not an open set. Um, and so the quantity that you see is typically bounded. Uh, let's see here. Okay, so uh, here's just a concrete example of Bayesian optimization that um, you know, has actually been used in practice. This, this was done by Francis Arnold's group here at Caltech. Um, and uh, the basic idea is that capital X is a space of proteins that we're considering. So uh, this is, uh, we're, we're considering um, a, a compact set of pro possible proteins. Uh, F of X is some fitness function of the protein that we're trying to design. It could be binding affinity, it could be thermal stability, it could be one of uh, a number of functions that we want proteins to have. And the basic idea is, this, is you know, uh, there are many details here that are very complicated from a biochemistry side, but from a Bayesian optimization perspective, uh, the basic idea is we, we choose a protein, we, we, we synthesize it or, or grow it, we take a measurement of this protein, which is, the fitness, which is a query on the fitness landscape, and then we, we try another protein. That's the basic idea. It's a, you know, the real, the real setup is much more complicated, but we can think of it that way for the purposes of this class. And the goal at the end is to find a protein that has the highest possible fitness. And so we can think of, we can theoretically think about the difference between that protein that we found versus the theoretical best protein in this, in this space that we didn't, we weren't able to find and think about the gap in fitness there, at least from a theoretical perspective. Uh, I want to briefly talk about a bandit example, even though most of this, of this lecture and this class isn't about bandits. Uh, here's a bandit example. It's about, it's about how to do a, a, a clinical trial. So if you do a clinical trial, like a vaccine trial, let's say, um, uh, the standard way of doing a clinical trial is what's called static experiment design. What, and this is very standard. Uh, and basically what that means is that the experiment is, is pre-planned. So uh, a first patient comes to, uh, comes to us and we give this patient our experimental treatment. And then the next patient receives the placebo and the next patient receives the treatment and the next patient receives the placebo. So this is like a 50-50 randomized trial where for every patient that comes, they have a 50% chance of getting the treatment of the placebo, and that 50% chance is not adaptive to the measurements that we've taken so far. So that's static experiment design. Uh, Multi-arm bandits, you can think of it, in, at least in the context of experiment design, as how do we adapt the experiments based on outcomes? So here's a, this is a gross oversimplification, but suppose that the first patient comes or the subject comes and we uh, flip a 50-50 coin and give the subject the treatment. And suppose we can immediately measure the outcome. This is of course not true in practice, but suppose we could immediately measure the outcome and we measure a positive outcome. The next patient comes, we give this patient the placebo treatment. So this, in this case, there's two actions in the space of experiments and uh, we immediately measure a negative outcome. And then the next patient comes, we give this patient the treatment action and we immediately measure a positive outcome. And so at this point, we might st start to think that the treatment action is better than the placebo action. Now we, don't, we have only taken three measurements and so we don't have a lot of evidence, but if we were Bayesian, we might think that there was like maybe a small amount of evidence that the treatment uh, is better than the placebo. And so we might bias the coin, this 50-50 coin, a little bit more towards the treatment and start giving the treatment more often than the placebo. So we are adapting the experiment based on the uh, measurement outcomes of the experiment. 
and this matters. So um, this is an uh, this is a screenshot from an article taken about ten years ago, uh, where you, you have these two cousins who were both uh, afflicted with the same uh, very lethal and aggressive melanoma, which is a skin cancer, and there was a drug that was in clinical trial. And the doctors knew that chemotherapy and standard uh, therapies did not work. And one of these uh, cousins uh, received the treatment and one of them was given the placebo basically because it was a 50-50 um, kind of, um, or, or it was a static experiment design. So it was just randomized based on uh, a pre preset randomization. Um, one of these people died very quickly. One of these people lived healthfully for several months later due to having the access to this treatment drug. So the idea of static experiment design um, is that, you know, um, every, the goal is to collect enough data so that we can reliably make predictions or, or recommendations for future actions. So at the end of the clinical trial, I have the best information possible to treat people in the future. When you, do, when you think about adaptive experiment design and cumulative regret, which is what banded algorithms care about, the basic idea here is that, well, you know, the, the people or the patients in the clinical trial, they matter as well. So, you know, if one of the actions is much better than the other one, you know, you know we want to minimize the cumulative regret of everyone, of every patient in our study. So that's the basic idea. Okay, so just to summarize, um, uh, the difference between optimization or Bayesian optimization versus bandits, it's the same interaction protocol. The difference is whether you're designing an algorithm to minimize simple regret or you, are, you, are you designing an algorithm to minimize cumulative regret. Um, it turns out that if an algorithm can achieve small cumulative regret, that often implies that the exact same algorithm can uh, achieve small simple regret. And the way you can see this is that you can rewrite the cumulative regret uh, like in the bottom bullet, where I, sim I simply uh, divided the cumulative regret by capital T. So this is now the average cumulative regret. So um, if you know uh, standard mathematical math uh, identities and principles, you know that you know, if you take an average of something, at least one of the things in the, aver in the, in the, in the terms being average must be above average. So at least one of the f of x1 versus f of xd must be above average. And so if an algorithm has small gap in this bottom formula, then one of the things it tried also achieves small gap. And so the final step is to show that we can relate f of x hat of star, which is the, the thing that our model thinks is the best, to the one that we chose in the, uh, to, to the best one of the elements that are in this uh, sum. And that depends on your model. So you can't do this for every instance of this problem, but for Gaussian processes, which we'll be describing uh, later in this lecture, this is true. We can actually relate f of x hat star if we have a Gaussian process model of what f is to the best one in that sum. And therefore, if we can uh, achieve, have an algorithm that achieves good cumulative regret, it can also achieve good simple regret. Um, so in other words, uh, algorithms that are designed for the bandit setting are often reasonable or pretty good for the Bayesian optimization setting. And that, and that depends on the ability to relate f of x hat star to the best in, the, uh, in this average. The converse does not hold. Some algorithms that are designed for Bayesian optimization are actually quite bad for the bandit setting. So the converse of this does not hold. Just because you achieve small gap between f of x and f of x hat star doesn't, doesn't itself imply much about all the terms in this summation for, for cumulative regret. The implication only goes one way. Okay, oops. Uh, there's, as an aside, there's a third uh, problem setting that fits the same interaction protocol and that's called active learning. Uh, yes, question? Yeah, uh, so uh, I'm curious, how, how much harder, like complexity-wise, is the multi-embarded, the multi, uh, the, or the cumulative reward setting versus the, just the regular Bayesian one? Like, is it, is it harder in complexity-wise, or is it the same? Um, so if we use Gaussian processes, so again, I'm just going to use Gaussian processes, 
in the worst case, they're the same difficulty. Um, of course, we don't have to model things using Gaussian processes, in which case um, things, get the, the, things get harder to, it gets harder to compare them apples to apples because the algorithms tend to be very different or some algorithm or you can't find algorithms for certain settings. But if we use Gaussian processes, which we'll be using for the most of this lecture and probably most of you will use it for, for your projects, uh, then they actually have the same worst case guarantee. So as an aside, active learning, which is uh, the um, uses the same interaction protocol, but the goal is to estimate this fitness function or this or function as accurately as possible, even in the regions of low fitness. So the goal is to learn a good global approximation of this of f of, of f of x. So that's the key difference. But we won't be talking much about active learning. So there were two basic ingredients to Bayesian optimization. First, you have to specify a model class. What is the functional form of our Bayesian beliefs? And given our observations or measurements that we take, how do we update those beliefs? And the second one is the algorithm. You know, given a Bayesian model, how do we select a new experiment? So that's, those are the two ingredients. And we're going to spend uh, the next few slides talking about uh, you know, uh, building up to Gaussian processes, which will be the model class that we'll spend some time thinking about. So basically we want to learn a fitness function. We want to build a, we want to have, we have a model class of a fitness function and based on measurements that we've collected, we want to fit this, we want to fit a fitness function, if you will. So and you, can, you can imagine the, um, you can imagine, you know, we've taken some measurements uh, like the ones on the figure on the right, where, where this is a one dimensional, uh, this is a one dimensional experiment design space. So X is a one dimensional, lives in a one dimensional space, that's your X axis. And the fitness with some measurement noise uh, is the, on the Y axis. Um, the goal is, again, to find the maximizer of F of X. So one only wants to learn the fitness function to the extent that it is informative about what X star is. Because learning, learning f of x is just the indirect subroutine, is a subroutine that is indirectly helping us towards this goal. Of course, if we, if we knew f of x perfectly, we can, we can just find x star, but um, you know, that requires actually collecting a lot of data, which we don't want to do. So uh, Bayesian inference is uh, something that will come up again and again in, in Bayesian optimization. So imagine that we want to uh, model the value of this fitness function uh, of n actions. So we're going to treat each of the actions as a random variable. So f of f of x. So here, x with a capital X is a, it's just a finite space of n actions. Uh, is this this vector of random variables? And we have some measurements y that we've taken previously. And so the way that you know you use Bayesian methods is you apply Bayes theorem or Bayesian inference where you know we have our updated beliefs also known as the posterior beliefs of what the of the fitness value of these random action of these n actions are given our measurements by by this formula which is Bayes rule so typically in in a Bayesian model we measure we, we have a fun, we specify a functional form of the prior beliefs, so the P of the prior on F sub, F, of, F sub X, and we specify a functional form of the observation likelihood. Given uh, what we think F of, F of X might be, so condition on F of X, uh, what is Y? So the two things in the numerator are the things you would typically specify when we do Bayesian modeling. So we specify the functional form of those two, and then the numerator, or the, excuse me, the denominator, P of Y is just a marginal, uh, of the observation likelihood and marginalize over what F, what our Bayesian beliefs of what F might be. So uh, the reason why we use Bayesian inference is because the, the blue and the turquoise quantities are the ones that we typically actually manually specify when we design a Bayesian model. And we use this formula to, to compute our posterior beliefs or updated beliefs about what F might be given observations. So uh, to build up the Gaussian processes, we start with a, we start by talking about multivariate Gaussian distributions. Um, Gaussian processes you can think of them as infinite dimensional uh, as infinite dimensional 
generalizations of multivariate Gaussian distributions. We'll build up to that. Um, so a multivariate Gaussian distribution is completely specified, uh, is specified, excuse me, by a, a mean vector and a covariance uh, matrix. Uh, that's, you see that in the top formula. Um, uh, for if, if x, if the variables are n-dimensional, we have uh, the mean vector is n-dimensional and the covariance matrix is, is n by n. And um, there's some properties that um, are not super important right now, uh, such as the covariance matrix, uh, we require the covariance matrix to be positive semi-definite. And what you see on the left is a description, illustration of a uh, two-dimensional multivariate Gaussian distribution uh, where there's correlation between the two variables. So the first variable and second variable, they tend to be both be high or low together. So uh, some standard things you can do, you can do marginalization. So if we only care about one of the variables, uh, not the other one, we can just integrate out the other variables. Uh, this should be a review for most of you, um, but I'm, I'm just going over this just to, um, just to help you um, set the context. Um, so we can do marginalization. So uh, an individual variable is also uh, a Gaussian variable. That's a nice property of multivariate Gaussian distributions. Um, oops. Uh, closure under rules of probability. So you know if we have two variables, x and y, let's say, or x1, x2, um, and we, we assume we observe one of the variables, then the, um, then the posterior inference, if you will, of the other one, condition on measuring the first one, is also Gaussian, and it's given by the formula up above. Um, so uh, in other words, Gaussians are closed under rules of probability. And this is really nice, because what that means is that if, if, our, um, if, our prior on, if our prior on F is Gaussian, and our observation likelihood, so P of Y given F, is also Gaussian, then that the posterior p of f given y is also Gaussian. So that's, that's really nice. Oh, sorry. And just to illustrate the figure on the left, so the, um, the two solid uh, lines are the marginal distributions of the, two of the two random variables. But if we actually observe x1 on the dotted line, then the conditional distribution of x2 is this more peaked Gaussian in the dotted line on the, on the left. But it is also a Gaussian. Oops, sorry about that. Okay, so why Gaussian? So just to recap, you know, it's, you can apply a bunch of linear algebra operations to it and everything's closed. So closure under multiplication, closure under linear maps, closure under marginalization, closure under conditioning, therefore closure under Bayesian inference. Of course, nothing in the real world is actually Gaussian and nothing in the real world is linear. Um, but um, we can use Gaussians um, to model things in a way that helps us make decisions about what experiment to design next. And that's the most important thing. As long as this is a reasonable approximation or model of our uncertainty, we can use it to design future experiments. So here is a bunch of measurements. Now we want to compute P, uh, we want to compute F. Um, if F of X is a linear function with, the, with um, you know, uh, a by offset term W1, a linear term w, uh, W2, uh, we could write that as uh, phi transpose w, where phi is this feature vector. Uh, and now we have a Gaussian prior over what w is. And so p of f is, takes this multivariate Gaussian distribution. And so, um, this, so what, I, what I'm writing, what, what you're showing, seeing at the bottom is the prior. So these are the slopes, the w's, and this, and this is just the, the prior distribution of what w might be without any observations. And then after we make some observations, why? And we, let's assume that the measurement noise uh, so is also Gaussian. So y given x is equal to the true, the true w transpose phi of x plus some measurement noise that's also Gaussian. That's, the, that, that's what you see in the top equation. Uh, then the posterior inference of p of w, so 
W is our F here. Given making some measurements Y, y uh, is this Gaussian distribution you see depicted um, below. So you know, the, the mean slope, the mean estimate of, the, of our posterior is the solid line in the middle. And what you're seeing here is just the variability, the uncertainty, if you will. And this is, of course, assuming that the functional form is, uh, is this linear model with, Gaussian, with a Gaussian prior on the weights. Um, Suppose we change our feature representation, right? So it's, it's, this is still a linear model, we, we just have a different feature representation. And this is basically equivalent to cubic regression. So if our feature representation is what you see uh, in this, in the, on this slide, then, and we, put, and we put a Gaussian prior on W, which is now a, a four-dimensional vector, um, then this is our prior on F. And then if, if, we, um, if we fit the model, if we fit this model to the observations and compute our posterior beliefs, this is our posterior on what uh, F is, or the multivariate posterior, Gaussian posterior on W, which is equivalent in this, uh, in this example. And then, you know, you could choose all sorts of, now we can just choose all sorts of uh, feature representations, because um, you know, you just choose your feature representation, and then you you write it as a linear as a linear model with a with a multivariate Gaussian uh, Bayesian model of what W of what your linear parameters are, and you can specify you know, all sorts of priors. Um, and then you could compute the posteriors. This is just another example. This is just another feature representation. And then this is the posterior, given that type of feature representation. Uh, you can do Fourier features. And this would be the posterior of giving those measurements. Uh, I just I think this is the last example. This is a this is a bell curve uh, feature, and then this would be the posterior. Uh, I, should, I should have mentioned that the, the dotted line that you see that's wiggling is the, our sample. So if we, were, we can sample from this Gaussian from this posterior distribution, and the, 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 the dotted line are what samples might look like. Okay, so. Now that we've gotten to this point, a natural question to ask is, well, what feature representation should we use? Um, and so uh, now we're gonna start to move, move towards what, what's gonna end up being Gaussian processes. So um, once we specify phi, um, then we can abstractly write uh, this multivariate normal distribution uh, using all using uh, the, the red term and the turquoise term. The red term is called the mean function, the mean of our, of our, of our distribution. And then the turquoise function is called a kernel function, which measures the covariance of different uh, points rep, uh, using this, within this feature representation. Once we specify these two, these two quantities, um, everything that you see above uh, is not is actually independent of the number of features. It's just it's only a function of these two quantities, and these two quantities may be parameterized by a feature vector, um, but but we can abstract that out and just look at these two quantities. And so, if we use a lot of feature vectors, if we use a, a huge feature vector, a feature vector that's potentially uh, infinitely infinitely long, so phi 
let's say phi is inf has infinitely many features. Um, then it turns out that you can actually write this covariance, this kernel function uh, you see in the bottom, you know, you could write it out, uh, you know, for certain choices of phi that's infinite, uh, that's infinitely, that are infinite with infinitely many dimensions. You can write out this, this, this dot product uh, scaled by sigma, the covariance matrix, as this closed form formula based on exponentials. So in other words, even though phi might be infinite dimensional, we don't actually need to, we don't actually need to explicitly uh, instantiate phi in order to compute the relevant terms, which are the, excuse me, which are the mean and the kernel function values. We don't actually need to ex explicitly instantiate phi in order to compute these two quantities. All, all we need is to compute these two quantities and then we can uh, use the formula above. And so this is one example where phi is infinitely, infinitely, um, uh, large or infinite dimensional, but if you want to evaluate the kernel function, then it has this closed form solution. So that's the basic idea. Um, we, we have these kernel functions that are implicit, that can implicitly capture adopt products of infinite dimensional feature vectors. Um, so here's an example where phi, where you have a 10 dimensional phi of a, certain, of a certain functional form, and then you go up to 30 dimensional, and then you go up to infinite dimensional, and if you go up to infinite dimensional, you get uh, the, the inner product of phi of x1 versus uh, with phi of x, xi versus phi of xj becomes, takes this functional form. And this is the posterior given those measurements. Okay, so now we're ready to write down a Gaussian process. So a Gaussian process is specified by a mean function and a kernel function. And it is a probability distribution over functions. Um, uh, and it has the following property, which is, Every finite restriction of function values, uh, or this is part of the this is part of the definition of a Gaussian process. Every finite restriction of function values. So if we only care about the value of f at a finite set of locations, so that's the that's these n locations x1 to xn. So every single finite restriction of function values uh, is a Gaussian distribution, which is a multivariate Gaussian distribution with the mean function mu of mu of x at those x's and the the covariance uh matrix is the kernel function of those pair of x of all pairs of those x's so this is a gaussian process it's an infinite dimensional generalization of a multivariate gaussian distribution where f is this you know f is this function uh, that's infinite. That you know is basic. Who's where? If you take just any any finite or finite restriction of f, so if, if the value of f at a certain at any finite of set of uh, locations, it immediately becomes um, a Gauss a multivariate Gaussian distribution. So any finite slice of a Gaussian process is a multivariate Gaussian distribution. That's that's the definition of a Gaussian process. And there are ways of using these kernel functions to, um, to then uh, uh, conduct uh, posterior inference. So this is the standard formula. Um, you can look through, you can work, through, work it out uh, in detail on your own time if you're interested, but it's a basic, it follows the standard Gaussian uh, posterior conditional inference uh, just with kernel functions rather than explicit feature functions, feature vectors. Any questions so far? Okay. So um, it turns out that if you um, compute, if you just compute the, so this is this is just a bunch of uh, math relating the 
the posterior inference of Gaussian processes to, um, to uh, L2 regularized least squares regression. Um, the key takeaway here is that if you compute, if you take this P of F given Y, with, which, and we're doing posterior inference here, and we take the negative log of P of F given Y, this is something we do very often in, uh, in CS155, where we talk about log loss of maximum likelihood. If we take the negative log of P of F given Y, the formula you see at the bottom looks a lot like least squares. Least squares regression with a, with a, um, with a regularizer. So we regularize the F to M sub X, with M is the mean function, so we regularize to the mean. And th this is just basically the L2 regularized um, regression. So basically what this is saying is that if we do posterior inference in our Gaussian process, the mean function, so the Gaussian process is specified by a mean function and a covariance function. The covariance mean function is exactly the solution to regularize least squares. So if we didn't care about being Bayesian and we only cared about the mean, we didn't care about our uncertainty, then Gaussian process regression is exactly least squares regression. The reason why we want Gaussian processes on top of just the mean function, we want the posterior covariance function. Where, is the, where are the places where we're, we're really uncertain where are the places that we're not on, or we're less uncertain. And so that's the reason why we want Gaussian processes. If we only cared about the mean, we're, we're just better off just doing least squares regression because they're exactly the same thing. Okay, so the summary so far is we've talked about, uh, you know, some properties of Gaussians and Gaussian processes. Um, and and the fact that you know they're closed under conditioning, they close under all these linear linear algebraic operations. That, that's why they're so convenient, um, and they're going to be they're they're basically the, by far the most popular choice for these type of Bayesian modeling for um, for experiment design. So if you look at the papers on experiment design um, listed on the course website, I would say something like oh, like seventy five percent of the papers use Gaussian processes as the model class. Uh, any questions so far? Okay, so now we're gonna move, move on from the model class and we're gonna talk about algorithms for selecting uh, uh, data points for experimentation and querying F. So the first thing I wanna talk about is active learning, uh, just very briefly. So re recall that the goal of active learning is to train uh, an accurate model of F of X uh, globally. And so this is the same protocol that we saw in the beginning, but the goal is to fit f of x accurately globally, not necessarily to find the maximizer of f of x. And the reason why I bring this up is because the algorithm that we designed for this is very, very straightforward. It's called uncertainty sampling. So because our goal is to fit the model fit a global model of F everywhere in the input space of that capital X, then the algorithm is basically saying, given, our, given my posterior inference of the mean function and the covariance function or the kernel function, I'm just gonna pick the point with the highest posterior variance, which is the point of highest uncertainty. And so that's what you see happening here. The algorithm always picks a point that has the highest uncertainty, which is basically the the, the, the height of the bottom uh, line to the bottom to the top line, which is the which is two standard deviations. So this is uncertainty sampling. Okay. Any questions? Okay, so now, now, now I'm gonna move on to algorithms that actually are applicable to Bayesian optimization. And recall that I mentioned in the very beginning of this lecture that uh, many algorithms that are uh, good for bandits are also good or at least reasonable for Bayesian optimization. And so we're gonna, just, we're gonna cover very briefly two algorithms for selecting points that were initially inspired by the bandit problem, 
And so they were trying to minimize cumulative regret. But they turn out to be also quite useful for simple regret or just finding the best experiment only. And the first one, uh, so this is called Gaussian process banded optimization or, uh, or, or also Gaussian process Bayesian optimization. Uh, but we're going to use the algorithms that are applicable to both. So to think about these algorithms, we need to think about the exploration exploitation trade-off. So imagine that we've taken, um, we, have a, we have a Gaussian process model with some, with some kernel function and mean function. And we um, have taken five measurements so far. So those are the five measurements you see on this figure. And, this, and you're seeing a depiction of the posterior. So the mean function is the, is the, center, is the centered solid line and the covariance function is captured by the two outer solid lines, which capture two standard deviations, which is just uh, 1.96 times the kernel function of x with itself, square root of that. So the question is, OK, I'm the algorithm, the experiment designer algorithm, and I want to figure out what point should I sample next. So on the one hand, I could sample the point that has the highest posterior mean, which is the red point. So again, we're all we're working in one-dimensional experiment spaces here, but in general, it's higher dimensional. But um, in a one-dimensional experiment space, about negative 4.5, x equal to negative 4.5 is the is looks like the place with the highest posterior mean. So we could just sample that one because you know, in expectation, that seems to be the best one. We could sample the one with the highest uncertainty, like in active learning. We're going to pick a point where the confidence interval is the, the widest. So that's like the blue point. We could also pick one where um, you know, the upper confidence bound, so the top solid line, uh, is, is highest. And that's the green point. So the red point is called pure exploitation where we're simply exploiting the knowledge that we have so far. So, so the knowledge we have so far, if we ignore the uncertainty, is just the mean function. So in expectation, the red point is going to have the highest value under our Bayesian beliefs. So we're going to, if we just exploit that knowledge, we're going to pick the red point. Um, if we're trying to minimize our uncertainty about our Bayesian beliefs as much as possible, like in active learning, we might pick the blue point. That's called pure exploration. And the green point is a point that tries to balance the exploration exploitation trade-off. Uh, it basically says, I want to pick a point that, that has the highest combination of mean plus uncertainty, which is the highest upper confidence bound. So the green point is the point that has the highest combination of mean plus uncertainty, which is a, you could think of as a trade-off between exploration and exploitation. Whoops. Um, something. Got messed up here, I'll fix it later. Um, so um, this is the GPU-CV algorithm, which stands for Gaussian process upper confidence bound. Uh, it basically, um, you know, another way to think about it is optimism under uncertainty. So about the format, sorry about the formatting issue. Um, and so you see, it, and so if you look at the formula, it, uh, it chooses the, um, the next experiment that has the highest combination of posterior mean, mu sub t of x, plus a, a, a posterior uncertainty, which is um, you know, uh, beta sub t times the square root of k of the posterior kernel of k of x. So the square root of a kernel function, so a kernel function of x comma x is the variance of that point. And a, so the square root of the kernel function is the standard deviation. And beta sub t is some confidence interval. So if beta sub t equals, let's say, 1.96, then this is saying, I want to select the point that has the highest 95% uh, confidence interval. You can also choose beta equal to, you know, um, uh, you, so you, you set beta to, to, to tune your confidence interval to the 99th percentile, 95th percentile, 80th percentile, whatever, you, whatever percentile you want. That's how you, that's how you tune beta. And so you see in the bottom a, a depiction of this. So the algorithm is at every iteration, it, it, it takes a measurement, it does posterior inference, and then it, it chooses a point that has the highest upper confidence bound. 
And so the one thing you notice is that the algorithm quickly uh, zeroes in on the region in the, uh, in the design space that has the highest utility. And it, and it starts to focus the exploration around that point. Okay, so what are some intuitions? So here's the intuition behind this, uh, this algorithm. By always selecting the, the, the action or the experiment with the highest upper confidence bound, which is the sum of the posterior mean plus the sum of the posterior uncertainty measured by uh, a, a confidence region, uh, which is a multiple of a standard deviation. Um, we either find, the measurement we get from taking the, from taking this from from querying this action, we either find a really high fitness action, or we eliminate a plausibly high fitness action. So this is the exploration exploitation trade off. One of two things will happen. We it turns out that this action actually was really good, um, or we we measure it and it's not that good, and our posterior uh, and our posteriors get uh, our posterior beliefs get updated so that that part is no longer very high. And that's how we, that's the intuition about how we trade off between exploration and exploitation. And, you know, if you're interested, you can read the, the, the theoretical details, which I won't be covering in this lecture. The other algorithm that I want to cover is called Thompson sampling or posterior sampling. So the basic idea of Thompson sampling or posterior sampling is that we have this, again, we have this posterior belief over F. It's a, it's a Gaussian process, let's say. We can not only compute the mean and the, and the, and the covariance functions, the posterior mean and the posterior covariance functions, we can also sample from this function. So we can sample an F tilde, which is a sample of this over this posterior beliefs. And then after we draw this sample F tilde, then we just pretend it's the true utility function. And then we find the X that maximizes it. So that's Thompson sampling. Um, so, you know, oops, sorry, let me, so here's a sample of, so here we've taken one measurement. We are, we draw a sample of our posterior, which is the dotted line. So that's F tilde. F tilde is the sample of our, over our posterior. And given this particular sample, we choose, uh, this experiment, uh, captured by the bold face X because it is the maximizer of this dotted line. So that is Thompson sampling. Any questions so far? Okay. So the intuition. It turns out that if you do a little bit of math, you, you notice that the probability under this algorithm selection, the probability of selecting any action X is equal to the probability that X maximizes F, the true F. So assuming that we're assuming that our Bayesian model is quote unquote correct, then, then P of F given Y is, is a calibrated posterior belief, uh, Bayesian belief over what F might be. So the X we choose is the maximizer of F tilde and the probability we choose F tilde is equal to the probability that F tilde is the, is the true F. So therefore, and you can make this more formal, the probability of selecting any given X is equal to the probability the, that that X maximizes F. So again, even though this is seemingly a completely different um, action selection algorithm than the upper confidence bound algorithm, we again have the same intuition. You know, we, we, we tend to sample, we're gonna, we're gonna either find a high fitness action or we've made a big update on our posterior beliefs to eliminate plausible high fitness actions from our posterior beliefs. And again, you can check the references linked to on the slide um, if you're interested in the theoretical um, analysis that formalizes this intuition. Yes, question. Yes. 
Yeah, uh, so, so if you find the, the X that maximizes for your uh, sample, but since it, it looks very, it can be very not convex. So can you actually find that maximizer in practice? So okay, does great, it work actually? Uh, yeah, great question. So uh, for both um, Thompson sampling and GPUCB, um, I've completely ignored solving the argmax. So there's an argmax here. If you look at, um, excuse me, if you look at GPUCB, um, there's also this argmax here. So this, so finding the maximizer is itself an optimization problem. So you have to actually, so the experiment designer actually has to find this maximizer uh, in order to actually run the experiment. And that can be actually very expensive, computation expensive, if uh, this, this maximizer leads to some kind of non-convex optimization problem. In, uh, in most of the applications that we'll be looking at, uh, it turns out that um, the space of X is going to be discrete. So, we're, so um, X is like a million different actions. So a million different finite actions, excuse me, not discrete, finite. So if X is over a million different finite actions, then, um, then solving this argmax is just running a for loop. And under the assumption that running that for loop is much cheaper than actually running the experiment. So querying, querying a Y, taking a measurement is really expensive. That's the assumption. And running this for loop is cheap. So, so you're right that in, the, in its full generality, solving this argmax can be computationally difficult. And there are some approaches that deal with that. I would just say for the purposes of this class, let's just assume that X lives in a large finite space. So, X is a million different actions. Any other questions? Yes, question. When might you use uh, Thompson sampling versus the other one, or what guarantees does one give you that the other one doesn't? Great, uh, great question. So. Um, First of all, you know, since this is a, a sort of a, a, a sort of a survey of research class, um, you know, I, I do definitely recommend these uh, the links in the bottom left, these archive papers, if you're really interested in really digging into the proofs. So there, there's both for the GPU CV governor confidence bound and for Thompson sampling. But to answer your question at a high level, um, these days, um, um, I would say that uh, your, your default, between these two choices, your default should probably be Thompson sampling. So in my experience, I've done a lot of research uh, in, in this field. Um, I would say that Thompson sampling is the better algorithm the majority of the time. In terms of theoretical guarantees, they have the exact same worst case guarantees. So in the worst case, how quickly are you minimizing regret? They have the, as, as a function of the number of experiments you're doing. And they both have the same, actually the exact same guarantees in the worst case, um, which is the way you, which is what the proofs are about in the, in these papers. So I, I would say that um, most of, I would say that the majority of the time your default should probably be Thompson sampling. It is, it, it, it is in practice empirically just a better algorithm uh, most of the time. Um, but if, but their worst case guarantees are identical. That what I'm saying is more of a, a, an empirical uh, uh, experience statement. Um, there are some cases where the upper confidence bound is ver are very important, and and um, because you know because Thompson sampling, uh, you know, is doing this thing in expectations, doing sampling, and uh, over a long enough iter number of iterations. You know, it, it, it starts to, it, 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 you get the same type of regret minimization as GPU CB. But if you really care about, let's, okay, so here, let me give you one ins ins instance where GPU CB is better. So imagine that, like, after, like, imagine that I have some real world situation where after, like, the first 10 iterations, I am not allowed to do anything really bad, right? So, Let's say I'm, I'm running an ex, let's say I'm running an experiment on a human, right? And, and and the human has a tolerance for really bad experiments. And after the first ten experiments, I'm not I'm not allowed to run anything really badly. So I have to guarantee that with high probability, the um, 
the, 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 the thing I'm going to do is not really, really bad. So you can measure that using the lower confidence bound. The lower confidence bound is saying, in this case, it's like a 95% confidence interval of, of how bad it can be. So this is like the flip of the upper confidence bound, but it's the same idea. So you can use, if you want to guarantee with, with like some confidence that you're definitely not going to um, do something really bad, then you can, you can use the lower confidence bound, which is the flip of the upper confidence bound to eliminate actions who's, that are really bad. So there, so there are many real world situations where you want to say, you want to do that kind of add that kind of restriction to your, to your process that sort of in addition to the, to the very basic mathematical formulation that's being presented here. And then when you do that, typically people use things related to a confidence bounds. But if you don't have that, my recommendation is, is to use Thompson sampling uh, because empirically it tends to be more efficient. Okay, and there are other approaches too. So there is expected improvement, knowledge gradient, entropy search. Some of these algorithms are, are not banded algorithms. They're only for the Bayesian optimization study. They only optimize for simple regret. They do not optimize for cumulative regret. So the two algorithms, Thompson sampling and GPUCB, are initially banded algorithms. So they were initially designed to optimize for cumulative regret, but because we're using Gaussian processes, that also implies that they have good simple regret guarantees as well. And that's the reason why I, 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 I covered those two because they're the more flexible algorithms, if you will. They're applicable to both banded settings and Bayesian optimization settings. But there are other approaches as well. The archive link here is a tutorial on Bayesian optimization that covers uh, the other approaches. Uh, so summary of the part A, part B is shorter. Introduction to Bayesian optimization, Gaussian process model class, um, um, there are powerful tools um, and algorithms for action selection, principal approach to the Gaussian process optimization. And I should mention that uh, we will have a reference code linked to on the course website soon, where we have, our, uh, we have some collab environments with basic implementations that we're going to put on the course website. We'll also link to other implementations uh, uh, implemented by other people as well. So that, the course website will be updated uh, quite a bit in the coming week. Any questions so far? Uh, yes, question. Was that a question? Uh, yeah, uh, so uh, I heard you mention that uh, well, one of the drawbacks of Gaussian processes is that it's uh, kind of challenging to choose uh, uh, the kernel. And I was wondering what uh, kind of problem, uh, or what are the markers of a good problem or for Gaussian processes? Um, it's a great question. Um, I think to really answer that question, you know, you have to, to, co to completely answer that question, you have to do a little bit of digging into the application. Um, so a default kernel is called the RBF kernel, which is just this exponential uh, kernel function that we, I showed in the middle of the part A. That's the default. Um, and that's what most people start with. As the dimensionality of the, of, the late, of the underlying action space gets really high dimensional, the RBF kernel gets worse and worse. So every, all the examples I've given you here, the, 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 the action space is, lives in a one dimensional space and we define an RBF kernel, this exponential kernel over this one dimensional space. So if your space of actions becomes two, three, four, five, 10 dimensions, 20 dimensions, the RBF kernel breaks down, starts to break down. So a good rule of thumb for Bayesian optimization is that the, the, the number of parameters you're optimizing is relatively small. If the number of parameters, parameters you're optimizing is very large, you need to do extra work to find a good, to really find a good kernel. That, that's the, that's the, perhaps the simplest answer that's most useful as the first, deci first decision point. Uh, there are other things that are a bit more domain specific. I don't have time to go into them. We can talk about them offline or I can do, you know, I should also mention that, you know, we have four structured lectures in the first four weeks and the remaining lectures are a bit unstructured. I'll probably do a poll of what people want to cover and we can do a more deeper dive into Gaussian processes for one of those less structured lectures if, if you'd like. So now I'm going to uh, move on to um, 
uh, part two. So let's share part two. Okay, so part, part B, this will be shorter. Um, so recall that we have a checklist of, um, we have a checklist of, for our original problem of um, data-driven algorithm design. Uh, you know, do we have pre-collected problem instances? Do we have pre-collected measurements? Or are we learning state for stateless models? Um, so the example that I'm gonna sort of spend the next 20 minutes or so um, uh, talking about are things that look like this one. So we have a training set of representative problems, let's say TSP problems. We have a solver that can solve these combinatorial optimization problems. And the, the action space are the hyperparameters of the solver. Um, and we, can, we want to tune the hyperparameters of the solver to be able to solve this distribution of problems very well. It, well, it could be running time, it could be cost of the best solution, uh, given a fixed budget, you know, one of the things we talked about. And then if, once we do that, we can apply the solver with these hyperparameters to a test instance that is, that is well represented by the training instances. And hopefully the solver does really well in those test instances. Um, so that's the key idea is we tune the hyperparameters to the existing solver, we assume the training instances are representative, and we apply the tune, tune solver to test instances. A second example, um, which is uh, actually very similar, is like a hyperparameter search for deep learning. This is something that where Bayesian optimization actually plays an interesting role. Um, so we want to um, train a neural net um, that um, does well in a particular problem. Um, and we have a fixed computational budget. And we have choice of neural architectures, we have choice of learning algorithms, they all have different, they all have different parameters like number of hidden layers, the momentum term, and all these things. And so these are the hyperparameters, and we, we choose those. We you know, run the experiment, which is basically running this neural net with this learning algorithm for some period of time on, one of, on TensorFlow PyTorch, then we measure the training loss or validation loss. So that's the second example. And then a third example, which sort of combines, excuse me, what sort of combines the first two examples is you know, we, have a, we have a domain of we have a bunch of different image classification domains, so a bunch of different training sets. And then we have a hyperparameters, which is what, um, which is what we, we, we showed in the second example. And then the goal then is to tune this, hyper, this set of hyperparameters such that on a new image classification domain, we, quick, we can quickly train a neural net that, it, that achieves um, you know, good performance. So again, the, the uh, use case could be like, um, you know, I'm Google, I'm Google, and I want to expose you know a good good hyperparameters so that if you're a small business using Google Cloud Services and you have your own custom image classification domain, I can quickly tell you how to you know how to how to tune things so that you know you um you can train it really quickly with a limited computational budget. Okay, so the key idea is we treat this solver as a black box. And the action space are these hyperparameters of the solver, and we measure fitness or cost. So we either so cost would be minimization, fitness would be maximization. It doesn't really matter; they're mathematically identical as long as you're as long as you're consistent about minimizing or maximizing. Uh, and given the hyperparameter setting, and given a problem instance, which is not always applicable. So here's the basic iterative procedure. You know, we we have a, a set of a set of measurements. Uh, that it's initially empty. We have a problem instance. So I'll use that. I'll use X to denote problem instance. So I'm changing the note that I'm changing the notation slightly. So in the part A, I use the conventional Gaussian process notation where X is the action space. Um, in part B, I'm using the conventional uh, algorithm configuration not notation where theta is the action space. But just keep that in mind. Um, so we choose a problem instance, which is X. We choose a uh, parameter of the action space, which is theta. We choose a running time, and then we run our solver on this problem instance until termination, or running time is, is, is hit, the running time limit is hit. And then we, we take these measurements, we add it to the measurement set. We can, of course, choose multiple training instances, or we can just choose a single training instance. We choose all the training instances in our training 
in our, in our data set. And then we repeat this process until the total time budget is exhausted, and then we return the best problem instance we found so far. And so this is just a repeat of, the, uh, of a slide in the first lecture, just to remind you guys. And so the algorithm the configuration problem is how we choose these different things. So the direct reduction of Bayesian optimization is, is as follows. So we spent about you know, 50 minutes talking about Bayesian optimization and Gaussian processes, and the direct instantiations is, is the following. So in step two, we choose every instance in our problem domain, in our training set. So um, we choose theta using a Bayesian optimization algorithm, and then T max is some large is just some large number. So conceptually infinity, but just some large number. And so what this means is that every round of this whole iteration, you know, you could think of it as a unit cost, right? The, 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 the cost of doing a round of steps two, three, four, and five has, uh, has the same unit of cost. So in Bayesian optimization, every experiment has the same unit cost. So basically steps two, three, four, and five make it so that every round of two, two to five has the same unit cost, which, you know, of course, uh, can be suboptimal, but that's, that's the direct reduction of Bayesian optimization. Um, and so the fitness or the cost functions here, I'm just writing as a cost function. So it's a minimization, um, you know, we assume that the training set is representative of any test instance we'll, 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 we'll see at test time. And so we want to evaluate the cost over the expected value over this distribution of problem instances. And so a measurement, if we do a direct reduction to Bayesian optimization, um, a measurement of the fitness or cost requires running our running a query, querying our, our experiment, which in this case is a solver, on every x in the training set. So this is a reasonable fit for the second example I described. So this the, recall that this is a, the second example, where we have, where we want to, where we we only are trying to solve for a single problem instance. So there's only one training set, and we just want to find the neural architecture. We just want to find the model, the deep learning model that fits this training set as, as well as possible with a limited, with a finite computational budget. And so here X is just a singleton set. So, so there's only a single problem instance. Um, and so, the, so Bayesian optimization is actually a pretty good fit directly for this problem without any extensions, um, at least conceptually. Um, so yeah, so the direct reduction of Bayesian optimization, uh, even more, uh, so the simplification from the second example is there's only a single problem instance, so we can just eliminate step two, um, or, yeah. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, so the benefits is that uh, this is a direct reduction of Bayesian optimization. Bayesian optimization is very well understood. Lots of reference algorithms and implementations. The biggest drawback here is that T max setting a large uniform uniform T max can be very wasteful. You don't want to, you know, you don't not all the not all experiments need to use incur the same unit cost. And so here's an alternative approach that's not Bayesian optimization. And I'm just going to go over it very quickly. So the idea is that Bayesian optimization is about choosing theta very intelligently, like GPU, CPU, or Thompson sampling. The, I'm going to present now an alternative approach that focuses on choosing T max intelligently rather than theta. So we're going to choose theta very naively. And so this is the hyperband algorithm. And so I'm going to give you a simplified version of it uh, just to capture the essence. So we set a computational budget K. Which is, uh, which is you can think of as the current T max or uh, the current T total T max. We, we, have a, we have a viable set of thetas. And for every theta in the viable set, we run it, uh, we run it for, um, whoops. Uh, we run it for K time budget. Sorry, that N should be a K. I'll fix that in the, uh, that's a typo. We run it for, for K time budget. Um, after we and then we we measure the you know the performance and, and stuff of the of the model, of the of the models trained from this these hyperparameters, and then we keep the, a top fraction 
Uh, so we keep the top k over eta uh, fraction of the uh, of the theta's viable, and we eliminate the rest. And then we increase the time budget. Sorry, this sorry, there's a little bit of a typo here. Um, to k equals k times eta. So now we increase everyone's time budget, and we do this uh, process uh, until only one theta is left. So, what are so so basically? Um, each round has the same total budget. Each round eliminates a constant fraction of the thetas, and then the budget per theta increase of, of, of the remaining thetas increases exponentially from round to round. So that's this is the Hyperman algorithm in a nutshell. It, there's, it's a little bit more complicated than what I'm showing you, but it's the basic idea. Um, so this is basically saying I'm going to choose theta super naively, which is the opposite of Bayesian optimization. I'm just going to focus on choosing T max intelligently. And so here's just a sort of a qualitative description of the algorithm. This is a two-dimensional hyperparameters of, of, for a deep learning problem. Uh, so two-dimensional space of hyperparameters. And you see here, you know, 16 different hyperparameters that, they've, that they're considering. And what you see in the right plot is the amount of computational resources allocated to each of the hyperparameters and the loss function of each of the hyperparameters. So this is basic the loss. So the resource is basically how long to run this particular solver with these with these hyperparameters. So an interesting idea would be okay. You know, um, <clears throat> sorry. An interesting idea would be okay. This algorithm chooses theta chooses theta really naively, but chooses t max more intelligently. Bayesian optimization chooses t max naively, but chooses theta more intelligently. An interesting research question for a final project, for example would be, is there an interesting way to combine these two algorithms into a unified algorithm? Um, so right, so just to summarize, we have high dynamic range on the running time budget. So th this, this hyperband algorithm is good when you have a high dynamic range on the running time budget. And so you can want to intelligently set the running time budget. And that's more important than intelligently choosing the parameter setting. Um, another issue is that another limitation is that this doesn't model relationship between thetas. For example, we don't have a kernel. So this is limited to a very moderate number of thetas, 16 in the above example. Um, okay. Oops. Okay. So I'm running a little short on time. I'm going to speed up a little bit. Uh, there are other approaches that are related to this idea of choosing T max intelligently. Um, I'll just leave that. Uh, leave this. You can you can uh, check these out if you're interested. Um, so the last thing I want to cover in the last couple minutes is uh, going back to this first problem type that we 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 looked at, which is we have a set of solver, a set of problem instances. Uh, we have we want to choose a hyperparameters to do on the test instances as represented well by the by the training instances. And so I'm going to briefly cover the SMAC algorithm, which stands for Sequential Model-Based Algorithm Configuration. And again, this algorithm chooses theta naively, which is sort of the opposite of Bayesian optimization. And, and it also keeps Tmax fixed, which is the opposite of the hyperband algorithm. This algorithm, the key difference between this algorithm and, and hyperband and Bayesian optimization is that it focuses on calibrating the fitness measurement across problem instances. And it also tries to learn a model that can condition a problem instances uh, if you have features of the problem instance. So I'll describe the algorithm in a nutshell. Um, we maintain an incumbent parameterization of our solver. We choose a set of candidate thetas, and there's a procedure for doing that based on expected improvement, which is one of the Bayesian optimization selection criteria. We select a set of problem instances. So if we, if we have a huge space of problem instances, so we, we, let's say we have a million traveling salesperson problem instances. We're going to select a subset via random sampling. And for that subset, we're going to run all of our candidate thetas on, those, on all of those subsets. We'll choose the best theta as the new incumbent based on, those sub, based on that subset. And we'll repeat from step two. So that's the basic idea. And so the key difference here is, uh, and so this algorithm performs really well. I, um, this is a plot I showed in the, in the lecture one. I'll just skip over this in the interest of time. Um, so the key idea here is that, you know, if there's high variability in problem difficulty, so we have this training set of tra tra traveling salesperson problems, some of them might be super easy, some of them might be super hard, 
And we don't want to actually run, run a for loop to loop over all of them simultaneously uh, at, at every round of this optimization because it's too expensive. So we're going to subsample it every, every round, like, like, like in stochastic gradient descent, right? So we're going to do some sort of stochastic evaluation of the fitness function. The problem is that if some problems are super easy and some are super hard, there's huge variance there. And we can sort of calibrate, we can actually sort of, um, we can uh, align the variance by, by saying we're going to evaluate all of the thetas on the same subsample. So that's what, that's the, that's basically the key thing that SMAC is doing in addition to the other things that we described. SMAC is doing, what I'm describing is, a, is an oversimplification of SMAC, but just in the context of presenting the most unique aspect of SMAC, given what we've already presented, that's the, that's the most unique aspect of SMAC. So again, we've, we've talked about three things. We've talked about selecting theta intelligently. We talked about selecting T max intelligently. And we talked about selecting, selecting how to uh, s evaluate our measurement function intelligently of this high variability in the way we can make, draw measurements. Uh, the related algorithm is called algorithm portfolio selection. Um, the key idea is that you, you can use not just a, a, the same hi parameter, hyper, not just two hyperparameters of one solver, you can actually just choose many different solvers. So given a problem instance, um, I can you know, predict which solver will have the best running time performance on this problem instance. So it's like SMAC, and it's like these other problems, but the hyperparameters include not just the parameterizations of one solver, but a, a choice of many different solvers. So this is like a meta algorithm that uses all existing solvers as subroutines. But the way you, this, way you tune this uh, algorithm is similar. So this was applied to the SAT problem, satisfiability. The algorithm is called SATzilla. And uh, it turned out that you know, there's the satisfiability competition and this SATzilla approach kept winning gold medals in this competition year after year after year. And SATzilla was actually, and learning-based approaches were actually banned from the satisfied, satisfaction, satisfiability competition after 2009. That's how good these algorithms were. Okay, so I'm basically done. Um, recap of part B, uh, Bayesian optimization is a popular framework for parameter optimization, many well-designed algorithms. Um, it ignores the time resource budget, uh, although there are approaches that address this uh, partially. It ignores the variability of evaluation so if evaluation needs to be done over a population of problem instances and then that population is huge and you need to subsample, the variability can kill you. You have to be intelligent about how you, how you, um, which problem instances you subsample to control for the variability. And Bayesian optimization ignores uh, predicting parameters conditioned on problem instances. So for example, if I have features of a problem instance, I can actually predict which hyperparameter is best for that problem instance. Um, and that's something that you can also do as well. So, uh, any questions so far? I'm basically done. Okay, so uh, the next lecture, uh, next Tuesday, we're gonna uh, move on to a different topic of learning to optimize continuous optimization, basically learning a new gradient descent policy. Um, so we'll do a brief introduction to differentiable learning, a brief introduction to policy learning, and then dig into learning to optimize continuous optimization. Okay, that's it.